Hi. I thank you both for and Joy for being here this afternoon. And so let's just jump back, back right in it. Okay. Yeah. So we'll start with Joy. Um, if you want to share two minutes about your self-introduction, that would be okay. great. Okay. All right. Um, I'll just launch right into it. And I know that that um, this forum is really focused on housing and I will really try to stay on target, but honestly, there's nothing that exists in a vacuum. And so when we talk about housing, we also need to talk about our interlocking crises of economic, climate and housing, race, racial equity all together. So some of these questions reflect that, but it'll be hard for me because I'm always bringing in more information. So what I think we need as a community is a robust and just housing for all program that, that just breaks through yimby nimby oppositions. I think those oppositions are, are generally false and don't lead us to anywhere positive or productive. Um, I think that we need to really be investing in the foundations of our community in our workers, in our most vulnerable people, so that really through that foundation, we have equity for everybody and we have more of a trickle up um, program happening rather than um, what has not worked for 40 years, which is Reaganomic trickle down housing um, and economic programs. So while new construction can clearly meet some of the needs of our middle, and upper class residents um, and long-term needs. I think we really need to be looking also at using the resources that we have as best as we can through using buildings that we already have through progressive taxation and, um, and really working together for community-led development that's less focused on market rate development and more focused on anti-gentrification working class, what do people really need in their communities? Thank you, Joy. Mm -hmm. Fred, I'd like you to share two, two minutes about yourself. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Joy. As usual, yeah. always a pleasure to be with you. Um, my name is Fred Keeley. I have dedicated my adult life to public service. Uh, I am a college and university professor uh, by day. I, uh, I teach at San Jose State University, my alma mater. I teach in the graduate program of public administration where I specialize in public budgeting. I also teach uh, class at Santa Clara Law School with former uh, Secretary Leon Panetta entitled Achieving Consensus in a Partisan Environment. And I teach at CSU Monterey Bay through their Osher Lifelong Learning Institute program. Uh, in, uh, I've held elective office for 24 years. I was a county supervisor, county treasurer, state legislator, uh, where a number of the issues we're going to talk about this afternoon, uh, we, we can talk about the work that I've done there. I'm very proud that for the first time in the history of the uh, Student Housing Coalition here on campus, that they've made an endorsement in the candidate's race. They've never done that before. Uh, that was announced today. They were kind enough to endorse my candidacy, and I'm very proud to have that. In addition to the building and construction trades, uh, the SEIU uh, folks, and I'm a founding member, uh, by way of disclosure, of uh, housing in Santa Cruz County. So I spent a lot of my life uh, in the last few years, working a lot on housing and integrating the community into that conversation, getting the best outcomes we possibly can. And I suspect we'll be talking more about that as we, we move along this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. So I'll start with you, Fred, up the first question. In the context of change in state and local housing policy, what concrete policies will you pursue to, to meet the affordable housing needs of Santa Cruz? And how will your housing policies meet community equity goals in terms of race and socioeconomic status and in terms of serving both homeowners and renters? Well, thank you. I think that it's pretty clear that the architecture that oversees all of this is the state of California statutes known as the Regional Housing Needs Application, which every city and every county in the state of California gets a certain number of housing units that they are managing towards constructing over an eight-year planning horizon. Uh, almost every city and county in the state can meet their unaffordable housing requirements, if you will. It's always very low, low. They're very hard to 
yet to uh, get constructed. John Lane and I co-authored a measure a few years ago with a number of other people that uh, became Measure H on the countywide ballot. And it was measured to sell bonds in order to build very low, low income housing in the community. It was countywide and it didn't get anywhere near the two thirds vote that it needed countywide, but it got 70% in the city of Santa Cruz. So my sense is we know a funding source that the voters can support. Now they may or may not support the empty home tax. I understand that, but in the event that that either doesn't pass or it passes but doesn't produce enough revenue, then I think going out to the public negotiating a bond for very low and low income housing and for the brick and mortar side of what we need to do on homelessness, which is shelter, navigation center, and permanent supportive housing, uh, that is a funding source and an undertaking that I think this community will embrace because they've embraced it before. It also goes to the question, I think, of race and class uh, in terms of who is the constituency that is the major beneficiary of constructing very low and low income housing. So I think that across the dimensions of the question that you've asked, I think that I have both the history and uh, the political experience to be able to put a bond like that together and uh, that will provide us with a permanent funding source to be able to address our RENA obligations for very low and low income housing. Thank you. Thank you. So I think the most important thing we can do to create more affordable housing is actually to change public sentiment to prime the pump for neighborhoods to accept Project Room Key and other transitional programs or the brick and mortar things that that um, Keely, Fred Keeley is talking about with the navigation center and, and um, other programs. So I think that's one thing. We also need to vote in the empty home tax. This is a progressive tax and it makes sense. And then next we increase the real estate transfer tax. That is just a no brainer. And just imagine how much money we would have made for the city with the $55 million sale and the $117 million sale of Hilltop Apartments just in the last few years. So we can also you know, pass other initiatives that support better use of buildings that we already have, double down on public ownership of land, prioritize for public housing as much as possible. And then we pass an ordinance that, that the municipality has the right of first refusal to all housing that goes to auction. We can also incentivize land trusts for community nonprofit ownership of housing. First, let's use what we've got. And I do think that an affordable housing bond isn't a sure thing. As we go into an economic a deepening of our economic crisis, we may see, like with the recent sales tax, a decrease in the public's willingness to tax themselves. And we can, we can also see in the last few years that in the state of California, affordable housing bonds have a really dark side. I know this is not true in every case, but Goldman Sachs and Graystar Management, Graystar now manages four large apartment buildings in our community, they are predators on an international scale of students in particular. They are not here to provide affordable housing. And in fact, what they do is they pretend that they're gonna provide affordable housing. They get a housing bond. The community is in debt because a bond is basically like a big, big mortgage. And my generation, your generation, we are the first two, two and a half generations that are deep in student debt and not able to afford housing. So a housing bond puts more debt onto the next generation, me, my kids, you, your families. And it, it, you know it's hard to get out of that. We're paying for it for 30 years and it's a massive tax write-off for Goldman Sachs, for Graystar. The UC Regents bought this, this building not for housing, it's for their pension investments. And Graystar is also in cahoots with Canadian pension funds. That's who's buying our housing and manipulating our housing market 
raising the rents for everybody. Thank so when you. we have these arguments about landlords and tenants, let's be conscious of the time. Thank you. You know, we should be looking at them. Thank you. Well, I want to respond for a second, and that is, I think that displays <laughs> a display is an appalling lack of understanding of how bonds. Yeah, we're going to do that during the Q and A. Well, are we? Okay, yeah. sounds good. Then we can talk about the appalling lack of understanding then. <laughs> Okay, so second question, we'll start with you, Joy. Okay. There has been a history of town-gown frictions, particularly around housing issues, both for students and for faculty and staff. What do you believe is the best path forward in regards to working with UCSC around affordable housing issues moving forward? I think this is really tricky. You know, they've had a long-range development plan where they could have built housing in the last 20 years, and they chose not to. They could choose to be a responsible, fair landlord for their students that they're providing a public education to. Instead, they choose to be predatory landlords that charge excessive rents for overcrowded housing. There is no justice in that. That money leaves our community. So I think we have, obviously there's diplomacy involved, right? There's meetings, there's relationship building, but we, our city council honestly has had to sue the regents over, for example, just recently water use. And that, unfortunately, our only recourse may be through our community power. And that's going to take town and gown uniting and organizing together and, and really pressuring the state to, to um make good on their promises, to not exploit our community so much, to not create this divisiveness between town and gown. I mean, there's a little town gown problem because of the geography, you know, the university on the hill, but we can reduce that through some simple ways like investing in public transportation. Much, much more transportation justice is one of the most important things for housing justice and economic justice. So we, I think that's easy. I just learned from sanitation workers this morning that there are two electric buses sitting in the yard unused for several years. We spent as a city hundreds of thousands of dollars on these buses with, with greener technology and they're just sitting there not being used. We need to invest in that public transportation and be fiscally responsible and accountable and transparent to the public. So. One minute left. Okay. So just to get back on track here a little bit, um, I think, you know, it's not going to be easy. And we can't simply do what we've been doing for decades, having meetings with the Board of Regents and thinking that we can convince them to do the right thing. They're not going to do the right thing just out of the goodness of, of their hearts. You know, the East Meadow um, project they could have built that housing already, but they chose not to. And when they put the proposal forward, they chose a developer that's now gone bankrupt, a developer that's not in the region, they're based in the Carolinas, and they've got a really bad reputation for quality, for labor practices. We have to really like, you know, push this up to higher levels and be much more public with our pressure on the regions. Well, thank you. Uh, I do think it's interesting to mention that transit and transportation are so important. The most important race and class question in the last 30 years in our community was on the ballot in June, but you didn't think it was important enough to you to engage in the campaign in any way. Uh, but I was very proud to engage in the campaign and be one of the top three leaders of the effort to defeat the Greenway Initiative, which was all about race and class. Uh, the people who wanted to tear up the tracks between Watsonville and Santa Cruz after myself and hundreds of other people who've been working for 20 years, get state and federal and local funding in to do exactly that, to have inner city rail, but apparently that's not important enough for you in the June primary to want to pay attention to that. So let me talk about the housing issue. The housing issue is an issue not with this campus, not with this chancellor, it's between the community and the board of regents and the office of the president. 
And if you don't understand that, then you don't understand how this works in terms of housing finance. The issue here is to get an enforceable and fair agreement with the Regents of the University of California. The city of Santa Cruz has recently gained some rather major leverage on that question, which is the city won a water lawsuit against the university. And there are certain expansion plans that the university now loses its general authority to be able to build housing or not wherever it wants. Uh, on the north side of campus, that has increased the city's leverage enormously. Also, we have one of the most powerful state senators in the state, John Laird's likely going to be the president pro tem of the Senate, which automatically makes him a regent of the University of California. He's a graduate of this university, he's mayor of this town. John Laird is going to be a major player to help us not just get to the table, but once we get to the table to have some real truck uh, with the regents of the University of California and the office of the president. Let me just say this, that I think the University of California at Santa Cruz is overwhelmingly a positive influence on our camp town and overwhelmingly failed every year to meet their on-campus housing uh, uh, obligation, which is then shifted off campus students who then compete for very few rental and that drives up the price. So if you wanna do it right, what you gotta do is you gotta engage with these people from a position of strength, not weakness and relationships is what it's very much about. As a former legislator and speaker pro tem of the assembly, I understand who those people are. I've worked with them for years and how to get a negotiated and fair agreement on the long range development plan. So next question, and we'll start with you, Fred. What are your positions on the two measures on the ballot that address affordable housing issues? Measure N, which is the empty homes tax, and measure O, which is the downtown library, affordable housing, parking garage, and farmers market measure. Yep, well, I'll say two things on this. I'll give you my, my, my campaign answer and I'll give you my personal answer. My campaign answer is I have taken a pledge to neither support nor oppose in a public way. Both On both issues, both campaigns have come to me and asked for my support. I said, no, all four, right? Pro against, for and against. I said, no, they said, we promised not to support the other side. I said, sure, that's easy, not a problem. They both then came to me and said, we want money. Can you help with money? I said, sure, I can. Glad to do that. I gave them each exactly the same amount. Now, let's talk about my position on this. My personal position is, is that the empty home tax, the basic architectural problem with it, is not what is it going to fund. It's that you can line up economists right to left, and what they will agree on is damn little, but they will agree on the following. A good tax is a tax that has a low rate, a broad base, and ease of administration. Unfortunately, empty home tax passes none of those tests. Secondly, because it's an empty home tax, you cannot bond against it because it does not provide a reliable, it will not provide a reliable revenue source. And then let me talk about bonds for a second because I wanna to get to this fundamental misunderstanding. The government sells the bonds institutions buy the bonds. That means they lend the money and the tax revenue pays those back. This in no way is bringing anybody in who buys the bonds to actually constructing anything here. So this canard about, gee, you should not sell bonds because Goldman Sachs may buy them. Fine if they buy them. They have nothing to do with housing in this community. We want people to buy those bonds. On the question of bonding, there is no involvement there. Now, if they want to come in and they buy the Hilltop Apartments, which Joy and I both think is terrible, fine. That's a bad thing. We all agree on that. That has nothing to do with bonding, which is why it sort of shows an appalling lack of understanding about how bonds work. And let me say the last thing about bonds. If you're building a facility that's going to last for 30 years, you should tax everybody who's going to benefit from it over 30 years. Not the people who are here now, they have to pay for it. And then people who use it for the next 25 or 30 years get a free ride. The beauty of bonds is that the useful life of the facility, whether it's a hospital 
or it's affordable housing or anything else, is that everybody who's going to benefit from it, its useful life, also is a contributor to paying for it. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Okay, well, um, I support both the empty home tax and yes on O. I, um, I've been a part of the empty home tax initiative for the past year. I helped to collect signatures to get it on the ballot and, and continue to be a, a big promoter of it. I do think that it is not a silver bullet. I encourage everybody who wants to know more about the pros and cons of this to watch the lookout debate that is online now that from last night because Cindy Dawson can speak about this much, much better than I can. Um, but I think every little bit that we can do helps. And I think that we need progressive taxation. We need to, we need to be redistributing wealth. We have 40 years of, of ever increasing exponential um, inequality, not just in our community and the region, but all around the world. And whatever we can do to shrink that a little bit at a time, you know, let's do it, let's do it. And if the empty home tax gets all the buildings that are underutilized, residential spaces that are underutilized in Santa Cruz into use by people who live and work here or actually use the buildings, then good, good. And we move on to the next thing, that's great. We have a lot of options. Um, to speak to the Our Downtown, Our Future, Measure O initiative, you know, it is a little more challenging of an issue, to be honest, because the city has bundled together projects that in and of themselves have some contentious elements to them. And so to tease it all apart, that's just really challenging. So I am incredibly sympathetic to the affordable housing component of the project. I want that affordable housing. That affordable housing can be built on that site. And, but really for me, the bottom line is the preservation of public property. When I'm elected mayor, the real big power of the mayor is setting the agenda. I mean, there's other stuff too, but setting the agenda is really important. And you know, there's stuff that people have wanted on there for years and they have not been able to get it on the agenda even to be discussed. But let's put on the agenda, the city council could have done it if they wanted to, preserve all city lots for public housing, public parks and community goods like health centers. They could have done this. That then would be, boom, not an issue that the community is all arguing amongst themselves over, right? Let's do the things that we can to really prioritize truly public housing, not market-based social housing that depends on higher rents to subsidize lower rents. Let's really keep things in the public realm, public ownership for us. So we're gonna take one or two minutes to do, share a wrap up and I'll start with you, Julie. Okay. Well, what more can I say? <laughs> it's our last chance. Come on. <laughs> There's always more. That's right. um, you know, I, I'm here as as a really as a community member. Um, uh, my experience is is in grassroots community organizing, and my experience is very different from Fred's. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've been a stay at home mom and an artist for. 20 years, my kids are 15 and 18. And, you know, some people question whether that's appropriate, appropriate experience for work in, in as a public servant. And I say like, what more service does somebody have to do than to take care of their children and their community for more than 20 years? Honestly, it, you know, it is, it is about relationships. Mm -hmm. And it is about you know, handling budgets and, um, you know, managing interpersonal conflicts and seeing the big picture of things. And, you know, I'm 47. I have a lot of life experience. And I think if anybody's in doubt, you know, just have a conversation with me. Uh, you know, I'm happy to answer anybody's questions. And, um, and uh, you know, I really do feel like we need a governance from below. The people who are experiencing the problems in our community 
they are the ones with the solutions. Whether it's people who are living outside or in their vehicles, whether it's our lowest paid workers who are not getting the living wage, let alone the housing wage that they need, they have the answers. The sanitation workers have the answers to what is going wrong in our community with services. And we need to listen to them. And that's true, you know, whether you're a middle class landlord with one extra house, whether you are a tenant, whether you're a student, a grad student who really needs a COLA desperately, mm-hmm. right? Um, or affordable childcare. That's, that's who we need to be listening to, not, not the top level, you know, making decisions about, you know, what equipment to buy or how to solve the problem. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, George. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Wrap it up, Fred. Well, thank you very much. You. Uh, this is the last uh, scheduled debate. Or, or, you never know, man. Or, no, that is true. That they is keep true. Throwing them at us. Uh, or mutual <laughs> candidate appearance, or whatever we're going to call this. So I'm going to assume it is our last one, and and. I say this at hopefully at the beginning and end, but I'm going to use a little more of my time. Um, Joy's right on a lot of things. We, we don't have daylight between us on a lot of issues. We've been, I don't know, four or five times we've done something close to this, something like that. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of commonality. And Joy is, a, in my judgment, is a very thoughtful, very well-read, very intelligent person. And and, uh, and and it's been an honor to, to share the dais with you during this campaign. Uh, you know, we are what we are. Joy is what she is. I am what I am in my life. And I have dedicated my life to public service. And I am very pleased to, in that regard, in this campaign, to have the endorsement and support of student organizations, one of which has never made an endorsement before, and on housing, they've endorsed my candidacy. Uh, the Planned Parenthood had choice between us. We're both pro-choice, unabashedly. Uh, and but only one of us has ever had an abortion. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> so. Guess who? Let's see. Uh, but Planned Parenthood has talked to both of us, and, and it's not that Joy isn't pro-choice. She very much is. It's, it's that I'm pro-choice and I got experience in operationalizing that in public policy and elected position. And that's true on the affordable housing question. Joyce, absolutely right. Who do you need to consult with? That's why I'm proud to, when the county asked me to head up the transportation funding task force, which was a hundred people to figure out what to do on transportation, they asked me to run that. When two police officers were killed in our community and the city wanted to put together a public safety task force, they asked me to do that. Uh, Most recently, when we were challenged uh, uh, with the issue around folks living outside and what to do about it and how to help, uh, the city came to me and said, would you head that up, the the, uh, the Council Advisory Committee on Homelessness. So I think that what goes on here is she's right. We offer very different choices. Mine is not more uh, somehow principled. It's a different choice. I'm proud of what I've done with my adult life and would love to be and would be honored to continue to do that for four more years as mayor of the city of Santa Cruz. Thank you all very, very much. Thanks.